بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين all right so we recited the first six ayat of Surah Al Ahzab and it took quite some time. It took three, uh, I think, four lessons, I believe, altogether, three or four. It took, it took quite some time for us to be able to go to the first page. And that's normal. When I, whenever I start a surah, I take time in the first number of ayat just so I, so I can establish the theme of the surah with, uh, with, every, with all of you and to make sure that the, um, I guess, the context of it is, is, is clarified. So that when we go through the themes or the stories that the surah brings up or whatever uh, the story is going to talk about, whether it's concepts or, or stories, that the, the, you you, you have a background, you understand why uh, the Qur'an is, ha, has all these concepts, all these stories in one unit or in one surah and what the point uh, that, the, that the surah is trying to make for, uh, for all of us to learn. And Surah Al-Ahzab is the beginning of a cluster of surahs uh, that talk about uh, the concept of obedience, of uh, submission, of ta'a or istislam lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it looks at that concept uh, from a number of different angles. Each surah takes a very unique angle from, from the other. And Surah Al-Ahzab is the first surah and the longest within this cluster of surahs. And it goes into a bit more, and it goes into detail uh, looking at it from the angle of of submitting or obe obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands uh, sp specifically when the command or the situation is difficult it's very hard to, to hold on to this command and I think that's something that we all relate to uh, when the topic is awkward or it's, uh, it's difficult or, or, or the situation is uh, yani there's a hardship uh, yani the circumstances are full, f uh, you know, filled with, with hardships so th this, this is what Surah Al-Ahzab talks about and Surah Al-Ahzab goes into a lot of detail and gives a lot of examples uh, for, uh, specific, m many of them specific to the Prophet Sallallahu life because Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by far was the, you know, is the best example for us in that, in, in that regards. Meaning he was, he was commanded to do many things that were very, very difficult and hard to adhere to. Yeah, and he, he complied Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with, with a number of commands uh, in different situations that were very, very difficult and extremely uh, hard. And of course, that shows you the level. That's a, that shows you a high level of obedience. Meaning, when 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 this cluster of students began speaking about obedience or istislam or ta'a or submission, it began by speaking of the very hard. Uh, situations of, of ta'a or ob obedience uh, or submission uh, because that's where it really shows. It's easy to follow the, you know, the, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when things, when, when, when you're in ease or the command itself uh, uh, seems to serve you uh, yeah, not, not just long term but, uh, but, but also short term. Many commands uh, uh, will serve you long term definitely but they may not help you short term. Maybe they're a bit difficult right now for you to, to follow or to comply with and that's why uh, so many of us struggle with different commandments uh, within the Quran and everything rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. So uh, the examples that we took so far were issues of inheritance and issues of, uh, uh, issues of adoption. Another issue of mudahara. So three examples. Uh, one of them between a man and a woman. Uh, a man and his wife trying to do something called dihar, which is neither uh, divorcing nor keeping the lady as a wife. The other one was talking about issues of adopting uh, people who, who don't know their heritage or people who want to you know, give themselves a different last name and how that's haram in the deen. However, uh, we're still encouraged to, to, you know, to bring uh, orphans into the house, but these have rulings that, uh, that need to be observed. And the, and, the four, and the third example was issues of inheritance that uh, you, know, you only inherit from your from your from your blood relatives uh, you only inherit inherit from your biological father and your biological mother and you only give your inheritance to your biological children and uh, these are issues that are prickly that are difficult to talk about that aren't comfortable uh, but but still we comply with the with the rulings and the commands of, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I went into a lot of detail last time uh, talking about these three three examples uh, today we'll start with ayah number seven ayah number seven uh, the ayah number seven and eight are a small introduction uh, and then after that, the story of, of, of uh, Ghazwat al-Ahzab begins. The story of the Battle of Ahzab will begin after that. And uh, it's, a very, it's, a, it's quite long, it's around three pages, a, a little under three pages of the surah. Out of ten pages, so around three, uh, just under 30% of the surah, is just talking about the Battle of al-Ahzab. And, and the surah is called al-Ahzab because it's referring to that battle, because it was one of, one of the most difficult days, or the difficult, most difficult times, that the Muslims as a group went through, throughout their development yani, and throughout their, uh, yani, their story. So we start inshallah with ayah number uh, seven uh, of Surah al-Ahzab. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِيثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَمِنْ 
مِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمَ وأخذنا منهم ميثاقا غليظا ليسأل الصادقين عن صدقهم وأعد للكافرين عذابا أليما so these two ayat transition us from uh, the introduction of the surah and the examples that were put in the introduction, the very uh, short and uh, summarized examples at the beginning of the surah, the first page. And it starts by saying, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا And remember ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, remember ya Muhammad, when we took from uh, the prophets and the messengers their pledges or their covenants or their promises, the word mithaq uh, and the word ahd, uh, these are words that have different means. Usually the word mithaq means a ahd that has a oath, an oath with it. So ahd means when you give a covenant or you give a pledge. And a mithaq usually means, it's usually a higher level than ahd. So usually that's what it means. Uh, at least for, for, from, from a Quranic perspective, that is, that is the usage of it. When we say ahd is a covenant or a pledge, mithaq is a ahd plus an oath. Meaning, not only are you giving your word, but you're adding to it. Uh, you're swearing. You're, you're, you're doing multiple oaths that you will you know, commit to this uh, ahd. So, if, I, if you and I uh, do a bay'ah or a mu'ahada and we shake on it, that's called ahd. Then, if we if we make a few oaths that we will, you know, commit to it, then that's called a mithaq. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a heavy it's a heavy covenant or it's a heavy pledge. And remember, ya Muhammad, when we took from the prophets their pledges. Now, again here, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا uh, The concept of remembrance is, uh, is understood from the, from the context of the, uh, of the ayah. وَذْكُرْ إِذْ أَخَذْنَا That is, that is what, it's, what it's trying to say. Now the Prophet did, did not uh, witness all the Prophets giving their pledges. But this is something that is universal. Meaning if you go to Surah Ali Imran, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِثَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ لَمَا آتَيْتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ Meaning that the time come when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the covenants and the pledges of all the prophets. And of course these co this is a long covenant. Meaning this, the, the, the pledge that they are giving a belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and the spreading of His message. And a part of that long pledge that all prophets take is that if, the, if in, within their lives, with if within their life, just in Surah Ali Imran, just to kind of uh, put, you know, put the parallels in front of each other. In Surah Ali Imran, with the ayah says, "لَمَا آتَيْتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ وَلَا تَنْصُرُنَّ." That if I give you the book and the wisdom, which is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives His messengers and His prophets, that if that happens, and then within your lifetime, I send a different prophet, a messenger who has certain characteristics. You, that will be at the end of time, meaning referring to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, that you will leave whatever it is that you have and you will follow him alayhi salatu wasalam. That's why sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, uh, لَوْ كَانَ مُوسَى حَيًّا لَمَا وَسِعَهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَّمِعَنِي If Musa was alive, he would have no choice but to leave whatever he had and follow me. And he talks the same thing about Isa alayhi salam and other prophets, that they would have followed him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of the, di the difference of, of the message of Islam uh, 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 or the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because all, all the prophets had the same message of Islam in its essence, meaning from a theological perspective, from an ideological perspective, it's all Islam. However, the rulings sometimes differ. That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu message is universal. In, in contrast to the messages of all the other prophets that were to qawmihim, meaning to their people, uh, to their groups, uh, regardless of what they are. And that's why uh, Surah Ali Imran it has that focus. Now here, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّنَ مِثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ And then we took it from you, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa وَمِنْكَ from you وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمْ and these five prophets, if you think of the names, Nuh, uh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and Muhammad وسلم, these five prophets are what are commonly known amongst uh, scholars as Ulul Azm, Ulul Azm, Rusul. 
the strong-willed uh, uh, messengers, the strong-willed prophets. And they are seen uh, to have a higher status in knowledge and in uh, struggle and uh, consequently Yawm Al-Qiyamah in, in status also in Jannah. And, and, that, and, we, and we find uh, evidence to that in the, in the night of the Mi'raj when the Prophet Sallallahu ascended and he saw يعني, Ibrahim in the seventh uh, sky and Musa Alayhi salam in the sixth and so on. So these prophets are of a very high, a very high status. Now why are the names brought here? Because these five prophets are only put in the Quran together in two uh, uh, places. Once here in Surah Al-Ahzab and then once later on in Surah Al-Shura and there's a different context uh, to that altogether. But it's only twice and I believe that the reason that, that, that exists here in Surah Al-Ahzab is because of the uh, theme of Surah Al-Ahzab. It's talking about difficult situations. I mean situations where you're going to show obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or ta'a, submission. You're going to show its Islam for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and issues that require strong will, that require strength. Meaning it's not, you're not being commanded with something that you're going to find uh, easy, that you're going to find uh, uh, with, with no obstacles. It's actually be, be going to be something that you're going to struggle with sometimes uh, يعني, fundamentally and sometimes you struggle with, with it uh, financially or, or physically or even socially there's a level of awkwardness around it whatever it is it's going to take a strong-willed person for, for, uh, to, to be able to follow these commands and I believe that's why uh, this transition in the surah came that the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet وسلم, that we took the covenants and the pledges of all these pro of you and these prophets with you uh, and we took from them مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا the word ghalil means thick. If you, if you are to take it from a, a linguistic perspective, the word ghalil means thick. Also means it's a very heavy one. Meaning there's a lot of detail in it. That it's not going to be, uh, it's not always going to be easy. وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيلًا We took from them, and from you, Ya Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, a pledge or a covenant that is thick, that is heavy. That will have within it a certain level of difficulty. That's the point of using the word ghalidah here. That there will be difficulty, it will not always be of ease. It's not something that will always يعني, uh, happen uh, b -b -b spontaneously, or you find it that, that, that it's actually serving your, your selfish or your short term purposes or goals. And, and, I, and I'm using this terminology, I'm saying this because I think it's important that we, we kind of see the difference here. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do in the Qur'an and, and through the Prophet ﷺ's teachings uh, are a benefit for us uh, long term in life and Yawm Al-Qiyamah I mean what he's telling us to do uh, does not harm us in any way it is the opposite of that uh, altogether uh, when we yassiruka lil yusra and we ease you into the ultimate ease um, when we follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we find ease Yawm al qiyam and that is something that we all agree to, that's clear. But you also find ease in the life that you are living right now. There's always also ease in it today. Now, how do we understand that with the context of what the surah is talking about? The surah is talking about difficult situations. Following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very hard. Well, how does that work? Well, it just, it's just like when you tell your son or you yourself, study for exams. When you're studying, that is not ease. That's actually very hard, but you're doing it because the consequences of this study, the results of this later on, will bring you ease. It's a bit, the only difference is something is temporary and it's now, and something else is a bit maybe long term, it's a bit later on, it's delayed. And the human being, kalla bel tuhibbun al our problem as people is that we want what is, what is now. We, want, we, we don't like results that come later. It's not something that we enjoy. We don't like spending time uh, yani, waiting for anything, no matter how small the, uh, uh, yani, the, the period is. And there's actually studies, it's interesting enough, there's actually studies that are done with children between ages four and, and six, uh, where, I know these studies may sound yani, a bit uh, cruel, but uh, they, they, would, they would tell a child that uh, you can either have yani, a piece of candy now, or if you wait for 10 minutes, you can have two. Right? So of course kids, and you know, some kids, most kids, 90% of kids will just take the candy now. And those, uh, maybe 10% of them won't, and, and, when, and they did a measurement. And usually the kids who are capable at that age of, of delaying for a while have higher intellect, or actually more intelligence, they have a high, higher, higher IQs. And then they kept on doing studies later on in different age groups. The results weren't the same in other age groups, so it differed because the, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to find a universal thing that all uh, teenagers want. <laughs> it's not easy because they have different, you know, they want different things. But for children, it's all the same. All four-year-olds would like a nice piece of chocolate, uh, regardless of, you know, of, of, of where they are in their, in their de <laughs> years of development. 
So the concept of, of uh, accepting that, things some, that, that pleasure sometimes will be delayed is, is fundamental in understanding what, what, what the deen is talking about. So yes, the mithaq is ghalil and, and the pledge is, uh, is thick and it's heavy and there are difficulties in it, but it will ultimately bring you ease both in this life and in the hereafter. And that is something that we need to spend a bit more time making sure that we explain uh, to ourselves first and then to our, you know, to our, uh, to our uh, children and our youth. Why? لِيَسْأَلَ الصَّادِقِينَ عَنْ صَدِقِينَ So this lamb could be uh, answering the reason why he took that mithaq uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala from all the prophets alayhi salatu wa salam or it could be saying that this is what's going to happen it was going to happen after these pledges have been taken and these covenants have been taken from these prophets, from all the prophets, uh, talking about these five specifically because they are ulul azim, the rusul, because they have that higher status and they are called the strong willed amongst all the prophets. لِيَسْأَلَ الصَّادِقِينَ عَنْ صَدِقِينَ To ask those who were uh, truthful or who were honest about their truthfulness and about, and about their honesty. وَعَدَّ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا And he prepared for those who disbelieved in all of this a, a painful punishment. So even the Prophets themselves, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in, even those Prophets will be asked Yawm al Qiyamah about the level of fulfillment that they showed towards the pledges and the covenants that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from them. You say that you are sadiq, you are honest and trustworthy and truthful about your belief in, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about accepting the, uh, you know, the message of Islam, accepting the Quran. We claim to be honest about it. We claim to say, yes, Ya Rabbi, we've accepted it and we will follow it. Okay, he will ask us Yawm Al-Qiyamah about that honesty عن صدقهم Let me see, it's, it's a very important, uh, uh, this wording is not, not, you don't find it too many places in the Qur'an uh, Surah Al-Ahzab has two out of the four places that have that wording But I think it's really important to think about um, You can say what you want Whatever it is that you say, it is merely a claim You are making a claim You claim to be honest about something You feel it in your heart, I'm honest, I know, I know, I'm honest about it uh, you ask me, Ya Rabbi, you, you tell me to believe, I believe, and I'm honest about that belief. All right, you're, you're truthful about it? Yes, I am. Ya Rabbi, I believe in it truthfully. Okay, we will ask you about that truthfulness. Well, how, how do you ask me about that truthfulness? I'm either truthful or not. Isn't that true? Isn't that how we're supposed to understand things? Either I'm honest about something or I'm not honest about something. If you ask me and I say, yes, I believe, and inside my heart at that moment I am honest, then I'm honest. Apparently that's not how it works. <laughs> What the ayah is telling us, apparently that's not how things work. No, how it works is لِيَسْأَلَ الصَّادِقِينَ عَنْ صَدِقِينَ Oh, you claim that you're honest about it. Yes, Ya Rabbi, I do. Well, we'll ask you about that, inshaAllah. There will be, there'll be some, some, some questioning about that. We'll question that honesty, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It will be questioned. Yes, it comes from the word سَأَلَ uh, سُؤَالُ which is questioning. So it could be he, he'll ask you about your honesty or another, a, a more uh, proper understanding of the ayah is that he will question those who claim to be tr tr truthful and honest about their honesty and truthfulness. And that, and that is uh, what the Qur'an talks about in general. And to the point where I'll give you an example, uh, the hadith Qudusi, Imam Muslim, that the Prophet Sallallahu says, uh, الله, and a long hadith where, where uh, he's explaining to us Surah Al-Fatiha, uh, it's a long hadith, but at one point uh, he says, فَإِذَا قَالَ الْعَبْدُ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينُ When the Abd, when the, when the servant says in Fatiha, Oh Ya Rabb, it is you and only you whom I worship, and it's you and only you whom I seek aid from, and I seek help from. قَالَ الرَّبُّ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers, هَذَا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي This is between me and my servant. That's it. That's all that's said. This is between me and my servant. I don't know about this. You're saying, that's what you're saying? You're saying that you worship him and only him, and you seek aid from him and only him? Yes, that's what I believe. Okay, that's between the two of us. What do you mean? Meaning, uh, we'll find out. Live, go live your life and we'll find out. Surah Al-Ahzab talks about obeying and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most difficult of situations. If you're honest about it, if you truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will show in your actions, it will show in your behaviors, it will show in your life story. When will it show the most? When will it, when will it shine the brightest? When will it be of most... Uh, uh, value when things get hard when things get really hard that's when it will shine the brightest that will show truly now when you think about it that's exactly what we do to people around us in our lives when, when things are easy we have friends and then sometimes life you know throws us a curveball and it's not easy anymore 
at that point, our true friends, our true friends, and we use that word, by the way, like we use that wording even, we say true friends. Our true friends show, and they shine. And that's the point where you know who you actually, your friends actually are. Why? Because things are hard now. When it's easy, it's not, it's not a problem. Ibadatullahi uh, farrakha wa ibadatullahi fishidda. The concept of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during times of ease, and then worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through times of difficulty. And they're not the same. They're not the same. If you think they're the same, then yeah, and you're in for a big surprise. Uh, you know, and, I, and I've seen it many, many times, and you will probably see it in your life, and you've probably seen it before. It's not, it's not, it's not a big deal for us to be good Muslims, to follow the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, you know, to follow the, the sunnah of the Prophet when, when life is going the way we want it to go. But then things can take a, you know, can take a drastic turn, and then what? Will you still follow? Will you still accept? Will you still obey? Will you still, still submit to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Will you still be a good Muslim? Or when things get hard, yeah, the harder they get, the farther you are away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The harder things get, the farther you're away from the masjid and from the Quran and from ibadah. And then things get better again, so you come back. It doesn't make, that's, that's not how it works. And, that's, and, that's, and that effect is actually the opposite effect. It's the paradox of what we should, are supposed to have within our deen. Yet that is the most common thing that we see every day. I mean, this is something you see on a daily basis. People, when, when they have time, when life is going the way they want, you find them in the masjid and then they disappear for six, seven months. And then you ask, well, where have you been? They say, I, oh, it's been hard. I've been going through difficulties. Oh, you, I should have seen you more here. <laughs> what should have happened is you should have been here more. Like I should have seen you instead of one pair, two or three, because it's getting hard. Who else do you have to turn to but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Isn't this your opportunity to prove that you can worship Him and submit to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's what Surah al is going to teach. This is where it shows. Now Surah Al-Hazab is a very practical one by the way. Today you're going to listen to ayat and, and, and we're going to talk about a few concepts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have uh, yeah, any unpractical expectations of His servants. He understands what goes in our psyches. Uh, he understands the human psychology more than any of us do. And you'll talk, but that doesn't mean uh, that you're not required when things get difficult to stay uh, yeah, submitting and obeying and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why in this the beginning those who claim to be honest will be questioned about their honesty. Let's see. Let's see if you're honest. Open your book. Read. Let's see. Read. Does that sound honest to you as you're reading? Bear in mind that you're reading the life story of someone who claims that he only worships me and he only seeks aid from me. Read and tell me. Is that what you take? Is that the, is that the feeling you get when you're reading this book? My sir, اقرأ كتابك كفى بنفسك اليوم عليك حسيبا. Read your book. You will be the judge of yourself today. You're going to judge it yourself. Read it for me. Tell me. What does this sound like? Oh, the first, let's say every, every, every year gets a page in this book. And you have 80 pages. You've gone through the first 10. Does it sound, Ya Abdi, so far that this is the, the story, the, the biography of someone who believes only in Allah, seeks aid only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, accepts Allah in the good and the bad, in the easy and the hard? And then you're standing there, you're not sure because you claim to be. You said, no, Ya Rabbi, I was, I was honest about my love for you. I was honest about, the, about my, my, my commitment to the covenant and the pledge that the, that the Prophet ﷺ brought. Well, are you? Let's see, read. The first 10 years weren't very good. All right, start with the second 10. And then you go through the second 10, and the third 10, the fourth 10. And what you're trying to do is, does this life story, does this mess, because at the end our lives are again one big mess, but are the constants in them? Are the practices that we showed, are, are the ethics that we carried, are the beliefs and, uh, and, 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 and plans that we had and, and aspirations and, and then things that we did and accomplishments, were they, were they focused on that? Were they, uh, are they testaments? Are they testimonies of, of our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do they testify for us? This is what Surah Al-Azab is teaching us. Your actions will testify. Your actions will say whether you're actually truthful and honest about your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. And it couldn't be clearer than Surah Al-Ahzab. If that is still something you struggle with, or you're not sure about, or you've heard different opinions on this matter before, Surah Al-Ahzab is the ultimate answer. It will leave nothing, no, no doubt in your heart. You can say what you want. It will be proven through your life. We'll watch. We'll watch. You'll get a couple of example, uh, opportunities, by the way. Meaning Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, life will throw you a number of... Uh, yeah, the, 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 the graph will, will plummet a number of times throughout your life. It's not, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not a straight line. It will plummet a couple of times. So we'll be given a couple of, uh, of, 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 of opportunities to prove this. I'll give you one more hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When uh, yeah, he talked about, a, uh, he was told uh, about a lady who, when, when her, when her uh, loved one passed away, she first of all said a lot of issues of objection. 
and she did kufr basically. Why and this and that? And then she came to her senses and she made dua. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, well she, yani, she this is what this person did. They're asking about it. فَقَالْ إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ الصَّدْمَةِ الْأُولَى Indeed, perseverance exclusively will be judged at that first moment. At the, at the first uh, yani, encounter. When you first hear it, what is, what is your first reaction? That doesn't mean that if you, make a, if you mess up at the beginning that you don't... No, you, you go back and you fix it and you, and you be better. But this is, this is how you know. This is an indicator for you and for me. Am I on the right path? Am I on the right page? Am I thinking properly? Am I practicing properly? No, you, you, I didn't show perseverance at that first moment, that first engagement. Maybe, maybe I need to revise everything. Maybe I'm not thinking in the right direction. Wallahu ta'ala alam. So this is, this is the first two ayat, and it, and it opens up that door. That prophets will be asked about their honesty. Prophets themselves, messengers. They'll be questioned about the level of truthfulness that they carried their covenants and messages to their people. So what about you and I? Then what are we, what are, what are we hoping for? I think, I think the, um, the misconception or the long <sighs> centuries, I guess, of, of, of us being told that since you said a word, then you're good. Khalas, didn't you say it? Khalas, you're going to Jannah. So relax. Has brought for our ummah just a, a culture and a mentality of laziness. Um, a lack of, of motivation. And maybe a, uh, a delusional sense of comfortability. Maybe we're too comfortable for our own sake. It's a delusional one. It's not, it's not true. It's an illusion. Yom uh, al-Qiyamah, I, I, I fear for myself and I fear for everyone, that we come and we find out that we were too, you know, we were, I guess we were too comfortable. And you're too safe. One of the biggest sins that you can commit in Islam is الأمن. فَلَا يَأْمَنُ مَكْرَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْقَاسِرُونَ Those who are, feel safety from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from the... Yani, if you feel safety, it's not going to happen. I've never done anything that de de deserves it or renders it. So I'm fine. أَمِنْتُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ right? أَمِنْتُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ have you, have you turned completely... I, I, do you have full safety from that? You don't, you don't, you're not fear, you don't fear at all? You are not concerned at all that you may be punished for the sins that you've committed or the mistakes that you've made? You feel nothing. You're totally safe. No. That, that's one of the big sins. You're not allowed to do that. Why? Because you don't know if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted anything you've done. Neither do I. I have no idea. There is literally no way for any of us to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted anything we did. If there were, then life would be very different. If you could say, oh, that action I know was accepted, then khalas, go. Go do what you need. If, if, if you know that anything you've done has been accepted 100%, then go enjoy your life and do what you want. Because you're good, as long as you have one thing accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He won't go back and not accept it again. And one action uh, one of true sincerity that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for Him to put you in Jannah. If you can just what, get one, Umar al-Khattab will say, ma nahwa illa sajda wahida. We just hope for one, one act of sujood. Where it's sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's so close that He'll accept it and then we'll get to Jannah and do it. Or through it or by it. Or with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you don't know. Neither do I. I have no idea. So how do, how, why am I so safe? يَقُولُ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يَقُولُ اللَّهِ This is a hadith قُلْ زِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said لا أجمع لعبدي أو لا يجتمع لعبدي أمناني ولا خوفان There will not be uh, uh, within my servant two states of safety or two states of fear فَإِذَا خَافَنِي فِي الدُّنْيَا أَمَّنْتُهُ يَوْمَ أَجْمَعُ عِبَادِي if he fears me and reveres me in this life, then I will grant him safety and security the day that I gather all of my servants, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. وَإِذَا أَمِنَنِي فِي الدُّنْيَا خَوَّفْتُهُ يَوْمَ أَجْمَعُ عِبَادِي And if he lives a life where he has no concerns, and he is totally safe and secure towards the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will put fear into him, I will scare him on the day of judgment, the day I, I gather my servant. And that is what we're supposed to take from, from understanding these, uh, these two ayat. Alright, so we'll start, inshallah, ayah number 9. Ayah number 9 begins the story that the surah is, is called after. The surah is called Surah Al-Ahzab. And the word Ahzab means uh, the clans or the groups. Tahazzaba uh, idha ijtama'a. وتعضد. So anything that is متحزب is something that is brought together and then held tightly together. That's why when they uh, different political parties will call themselves أحزاب حزب, right? Because a, a, a number of people who are like-minded, who work together, who hold on together. So what happened was, uh, يعني, to kind of before we start reading, go into some يعني, some of the history. After uh, so Badr happened in the second year of his uh, of his hijrah to Medina, صلى الله عليه وسلم, and Uhud happened the year later. 
Now, he, he, uh, they were victorious in Badr, and then there was a setback in Uhud. Um, some historians say it was, a, you know, it was a retreat or a mutual retreat. I'm, I'm totally comfortable saying it was a defeat. They were defeated, and many Muslims were killed, and some many of them uh, were granted shahada, like Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, and يعني, Mus'ab ibn Umair, يعني, many, many, many great names. Uh, there's over. يعني, Around 70 Muslims died that day, and some of them very, very known names, household names at the time, and even today. Um, after that, the people of, 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 of Quraysh felt that they, they had a chance, they had a, an opportunity to finally uh, get rid of the Muslims. Now, they didn't do it alone. At the time, also, there was, there was a tribe, uh, a Jewish tribe within Medina that w was required to leave. They had tried to kill the Prophet, وسلم, and he asked them to leave, so they left. Now, when they left, they didn't leave quietly. They decided that they were going to go. Uh, so, they, one, of their, one, of their, uh, one of the men, uh, 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 one of their leaders, went around. Uh, I think it's Huyay ibn Akhtab. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but. Um, I'll look it up. Anyways, one of the leaders of, of that tribe, Ben Nadir, he went around uh, Arabia trying to get support from the tribes to help uh, destroy the Muslims. And he would, he would accept from each tribe even, um, even a few men. Even if you just send a few, just a representative. Just to say that you're a part of our group, that you're, you're with us, even if you're not willing to put in large numbers. And Ghatafan, with the uh, you know, uh, leadership of Uyayna bin Hassan, they brought around 3,000 uh, fighters, and Quraysh brought uh, a similar name, a uh, similar number, all together added up to around 10,000 warriors from different tribes and different religions. I mean, some of them were even from, from Jewish tribes. Now, Arabia had never seen an act of unity before in that perspective. They never, never before in Arabia had tribes uh, from different backgrounds, different parts of Arabia actually come together to do anything. Um, but they were able to uh, be united to destroy the Muslims. And this is what their, this is what their, um, uh, their plan was. Now, the Prophet وسلم, because he has his spies all around Arabia, he, he found out about this quite early. So before even the 10,000 were put together, before he knew what the numbers were, he knew that there was a plot being, being prepared. And his estimation was that the numbers were going to be overwhelming. Meaning he doesn't know how many people they're going to be exactly, but the way he sees it, enough people are going to be put together where the Muslims, how many Muslims were there in Medina all together? 3,000. Oh, men, women, elderly, uh, children, everyone. All together, 3,000 people. Uh, warriors, you had like top, top, uh, you know, 1,500 people. That is if you add everybody who can carry a sword. Now, 1,500 to fight off, yeah, I need five or 6,000. These are numbers that are, yeah, complete, just don't work out. So, Ali Salatu Wasallam gathered the Sahaba and he talked to them about what he knows is happening and he's asking for what do we do? Ashiru Ali, give me some advice, what should we do here? And in the known story, uh, Sayyidina Salman al Farisi, radiallahu anhu, the known Sahabi, said, Ya Rasulullah, kunna. كنا أهل الفرس أو كنا يعني لما كنت في فارس كنا إذا كن إذا غزينا خندقنا حولنا meaning if we were being raided by people who are stronger than us or outnumbered us then we would actually trench around ourselves we would just dig really very deep wide trenches around ourselves and then put barricades so that no one could come across and that and then we just hold our ground for as long as we as as we could and usually the uh, armies need food and water and and they get tired and they get bored and, 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 and they can't stay forever. And usually that, that's how it works. Now the Prophet وسلم, listening to this very, uh, to him and to the Sahaba who were seeing, that was a bizarre idea. It's a, it, they'd never heard that before. They never even considered anything close to that. Uh, because this is the first time they've heard it. And it's a foreign idea from people who are actually the, the enemies of the Arabs. The Persians have always been the enemies of the Arabs historically. There always been a lot of wars between them. And for, the, for you to take an idea from them sounds, you know, very uh, foreign in, in a certain sense. But the Prophet ﷺ liked the idea. And he said, what do you think of the idea of Salman? I think it's a good idea. And the Sahaba, yeah, they all agreed. And that shows you the level of flexibility that the Sahaba carried, actually, that they were capable of taking an idea that is that hard. Because when you think about it, I'm going to tell you, the, uh, the way Medina is built, if you're going to go uh, visit Medina, Medina from both uh, the east and the west has volcanic rock area. Nothing till this day can actually move on that. No armies and tanks, nothing can actually move on it. It is impossible. Uh, the rock is, uh, uh, you know, just the nature of these rocks and, and how they're put, is just, you, you can't can't move there. So infantry, uh, uh, soldiers, they, they can't move on that rock. From the south, you have the walls of all the big fortresses of Banu Quraidah, which is a Jewish tribe that lives in Medina. And they had signed the treaty with the Prophet وسلم, to protect Medina when things get hard. And uh, they had uh, pledged that, yeah, we will protect, and we'll protect the southern part of Medina, which is a very small opening. Like there's only a small opening from the south, but it's there. 
And it's a huge, you know, high walls with you know big gates, and only if they're open from the inside can you actually infiltrate, you know, penetrate it. All that le all that's left in Medina is the northern uh, part. It's open from the north only. How long? How how long is the uh, distance? It's around five kilometers. So around five kilometers long, this trench is going to be. Uh, it's it's three three meters uh, wide and four meters deep. So uh, actually, what? Uh, it all, all 1,500 are going to uh, are going to dig. What what it, what it ends up uh, you know, uh, when you do the math, every person has to uh, dig what is equivalent today to a standard room in your house. So when you sit in your room today, so it's three three by four meters, sit and look around. This is what you would have to dig in the in the rocky uh, uh, ground of Medina. Now, if you go, <laughs> if you go to Saudi Arabia, it is not. It is just it is pure rock. You're talking, yeah, you need, you need not, and you have to, you have to wail out this, this ground, and, and that's a lot of work. And they had 10 days to get it done. Some generations say 15, but uh, we're, we're more comfortable. It's around 10 days they had to get this done before uh, the Ahzab actually made it. And the Muslims uh, yeah, and he, uh, began, began working and they got it done. So that's just kind of like the, uh, a, a simple understanding. Now, basically, if they don't get it done on time, uh, they're going to be wiped out. You're not bringing 10,000 people. They found out during the, the digging time that actually the number of, of the Ahzab are 10,000. And for them, as a population of only 3,000, only 1,500 who actually uh, can fight, the other 1,500 are in the forts. Like the men, uh, the, you know, the elderly, the women, the children, the women who can't fight, children who are too young, are all disabled, all, all, all are in forts. It's only 1,500 left, and there wasn't much food. It was a time uh, of, of the year where there was not, 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 the resources were, were you know, very scarce. So it was very scary for them as they worked. So um, the ayat that we're going to read, uh, they start at the end. In the surah, it begins the story right at the end. tells you how things work out. And then it rewinds back and it goes through a number of, uh, of incidents that happened during this ghazwa that uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ himself and the Sahaba uh, had to learn from. And it's important for us to, to, to study these ayat and to learn from them what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wants us to learn from them. So we're going to read the first ayah inshallah and go on with the, uh, and you're going to hear a description that is very, uh, that is very, very dynamic. So we start from ayah number nine inshallah. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu dhkuru ni'mati Allahi alaykum. جاءتكم جنود فأرسلنا عليهم ريحا وجنودا لم تروها وكان الله بما تعملون بصيرا all right. Oh, those who believe, remember the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the ni'mat Allah, the bliss of Allah, the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you, alaykum. إِذْ جَاءَتْكُمْ junud, When soldiers came your way. The word junud, I, I struggle with, with, uh, with translating this word into English properly. And I've read a number of different opinions on how it's translated. I don't like any of them. Um, because the word jundi, uh, is commonly used as soldier, and, and that is that is the most, by far, the most common use uh, of of the word uh, a soldier in, in a in a military context. But the word jundi also means someone who does something for you. Anyone who does something for you is your jundi. Anyone who you send to do something on your behalf, by your from your command to serve a purpose of your own, is. A jundi of your own, and and from that we understand. And the only one who knows the junud of your Lord is Himself, Subhanahu wa Taala. So He has junud, Subhanahu wa Taala. What does that mean? He has uh, creations that serve His purposes, that do what He commands them to do. You can call them soldiers, but they're not all soldiers. Most of them aren't soldiers. Most of them don't carry any weapons at all. And this is the example that we're going to find here in the surah. They're not carrying any weapons, but they're still the junood of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is basically what it means are those who, uh, <coughs> who follow Allah's commands and do what He wants them to do to serve a purpose that He ordered them to serve for Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the junood means. And if you can come up with a, with a translation for that and then give it to me, I'd be very, very thankful for it. But I, can't, I haven't found anything that I'm happy with. Every, every word that is used is very... 
It just doesn't really explain the, the concept uh, clearly. <laughs> but here the first word junood is actually soldiers because 10,000 soldiers came to, uh, to Medina. So remember the, the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when soldiers came to you. فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا And we sent upon them rih. Rih is wind. وَجُنُودًا لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And junood that you did not see. And creations that I sent, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Himself, that you did not see, that caused this to end. Examples of that, fear, doubt, right? betrayal, treason. These are the things, the examples of things that happened amongst the people who came that caused the siege or caused the, the, the battle of Ahzab to end. Because it wasn't really a, wasn't really a battle. Uh, two armies did not uh, confront and start fighting. It was more of a siege where they just stood around uh, Medina trying to figure out how they're going to penetrate this trench. The trench was, built, was dug. Again, it's four meters deep, it's three meters wide. All the debris, all the, uh, uh, the sand and the rock that is being taken out is going to be put on the side of the Muslims. So you end up with a, with a barricade, with, 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 a, with a small hill of, of, of dirt and, and rock that Muslims can sit behind. Right? So now it's impossible for a horse to actually jump. Uh, even if it can jump the three meters, it can't, it's, it's not, uh, um, uh, the, the land isn't, isn't flat in front of it. It has to, it's going to jump on the, uh, on the beginning of a small hill. And the Muslims are right behind it with their swords and with their, uh, with their bows and arrows. Uh, and basically what the Muslims did. All 1500, if you, and this, this is what the Prophet ﷺ told them. You dig this area and you defend it. So if you didn't dig well, uh, they're going to come through you and they're going to kill you. The first, first one to die is going to be you. So if you want to live, make sure you dig this properly. So it was, a very, it was a, very, a very effective way to make sure everyone did their job properly. So they dug and, and they were done. By the 10th day it was finished and the, all the, the, the sand barricades were all prepared with the rocks and the Muslims knew their positions. And of course you can imagine the surprise in the eyes of Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl. And يعني, uh, when they came in, they, Abu Jahl wasn't there, sorry, Abu Sufyan and, and those who were, uh, يعني, who were still, with, still, still alive from the, from the leaders of Quraysh and Uyayn ibn Hislan. When they came and they found, it's a trench. It wasn't a joke. Like, the, are you serious? Is it, is it five kilometers long? Send someone to find out. And yeah, he goes and comes, yeah, it's, it's five kilometers long. No. So there's literally no way for us to get inside? No. There's no way for you to get inside. What about from the east and the west? You know, you, you know better than that. We can't enter yesterday from the east and the west. It's, you can't, you, no one can walk there. What about Banu Qurayza in the south? They, 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 they signed a treaty with him. They're not going to let us in. <laughs> so now they're standing here in front of this trench, looking, da looking down a, a four meter hole <laughs> with a barricade of sand and rock on the other side. And Muslims with their bows and arrows right there, just you jump in, jump in and you're going to be done. And, and, and they tried. Yeah, so the, most of the battle was just uh, you know, the, the Ahzab uh, uh, y using the bows and arrows, trying to kill people who maybe are off guard or did, don't have their... And the same thing, the Muslims on the other side. Are just, so it's just, they're just throwing at each other bows and arrows the whole, you know, arrows the whole time. That's pretty much the, as, as far as it went. A few people jumped into the um, trench and asked for, for a fight, and, you know, and mo mo all three of them, who, all three people who did that were killed. But it was a very... Uh, there wasn't much fight here. However, uh, the Muslims who are living in Medina, every morning they open the window, they look outside, and they see 10,000 people on the other side of a hole, of a trench. All it takes is one penetration. And they brought in uh, you know, pieces of wood, long, long palm trees, trying to put on bridges and get, they tried everything, basically. The Muslims were there to fight it all off. They were there to make sure that they couldn't, they couldn't get, get any of that done. If, they, if, if, a, if a palm tree was put, it was pulled out or thrown into the trench again. They tried to you know, pile in uh, yeah, any, uh, debris to, to, to fill up the trench, and whoever tried, they would end up being, you know, uh, to take an arrow to the header. So it, it was a problematic thing, but every day, yes, we're, we're safe so far, but we don't know. You never know. Things can go wrong so easily. So easily. All it takes is one penetration. Just one mistake. Just one part of that trench to be to no longer be uh, protected properly and they find a way, they find a small you know, way to, to build a small bridge and, they're, and they're, once they're in, they're in, you can't stop them. Once they start getting in, that's it, it's over. Another problem was the, was the, the Yahud Bani Quraidha. They signed the treaty and they can't, their, their forts are unpenetrable, you can't go through, but you never know. All it takes is uh, for them to open the gates and they come from the south, what they're going to find in front of them right away, the forts of the, how all the disabled and the children and the women will slaughter all of them and then it's over. So the Muslims have to retreat back to the south and then they leave a lot of the, the, the khandaq uh, yani open, there's no, no one's washing and they start coming through and, and the thing is done. It'll, it'll end very quickly. Now it stayed for over 20 days. Now, 
فَأَصَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا وَجُنُودًا لَمْ تَرَوْهَا We sent upon them wind and other junood that you did not see, you didn't know about. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ending of this was easy. He can end it subhanahu wa ta'ala anytime he wants. Wind ended it. Wind was annoying enough for them to the point where like, you know, this is not worth it. It's not worth it. This is too much. We can't breathe. We can't eat. We can't sleep. We can't move. We can't do anything. We can't even see. You, you, you get a torch. Getting a torch at the time is not an easy thing. You have to get a good piece of wood. You have to, uh, you know, get a piece of cloth and you have to soak it and then you have to turn it around. And then you finally get, you walk outside the wind, turns it off. It's full of sand. It won't work again. You cannot turn it on again because uh, uh, if you've ever been, uh, they're called riyah samum and I think uh, this is called riyah saba the ones that actually ended the, uh, the siege of Al-Ahzab were called Riyah al-Sabah. I've seen them once before. It was a very interesting uh, experience. We were in the car, it was 19, I think 1997, Allahu something like that. And we were driving from Medina to Mecca. Uh, we had done Umrah, we were going back to Medina. And on the way there, uh, you, could see, you could see in the distance, because uh, usually driving in Saudi Arabia is the, mo is the most boring drive in the world because you can see the horizon all the time. Like it's, just, it's, just, it's just desert and mountains everywhere. But at a certain point, you couldn't see the horizon anymore. And my dad knew what was going on, so he took a right, put up the, <laughs> put up the windows. Uh, we had, we, uh, he, had some, he had stashed a number of, of, of uh, blankets and towels to close all the, you know, the openings within the car. And for 10 minutes, you couldn't see anything. For 10 minutes, you could see nothing. Uh, all you saw was just dust outside, and, and the car was, you know, w w jiggly. It was very scary. I was, uh, I was quite young at the time, but uh, it ten minutes it was done, and then well, what, what's left is, is hilarious. You don't know where the highway is anymore. You have no idea where the highway. The highway is gone. It's basically it's covered with sand. No one knows. So they have to you have to wait until. Um, uh, cars coming from after or later on uh, show you where the way is and you can start driving again but for, for uh, if you if you forgot where you took how how much of a right you took or how much of a left you took you have no idea where, where the road is it's a very very i'm imagining if you're standing outside with a tent or then you know you basically cannot you can't do anything the muslims uh, for them it was fine they were behind the barricade of the uh, so actually the barricade of of, of uh, dirt and sand and, and, and rock that they had built uh, served them well because it protected them however the, the, you know, the ahzab were in the open they weren't protected by anything in medina there's a lot of palm trees there's a lot of buildings that will keep you safe outside in the open you're not safe to the point where uh, it's narrated to us, Hudayf ibn al Iman got to see it with his own, his own eyes. And he said, what I, what I saw was big pots carried in the, in, by the wind. The wind was carrying pots that, have you ever seen pots that um, they use to feed armies? Uh, yeah, and it's usually, I remember, <laughs> if you wanted to drink tea, the tea was made in these huge, huge pots. Uh, you had to three people to carry, <laughs> carry the pot. And it's, like, just, it's full of tea and people are I don't know, talking and spitting and it's, it's disgusting. But you drink it anyway because you haven't seen tea for the last week or so. But that's how, and they're big pots, they're very, very heavy. And yet the wind was carrying these pots and throwing them in the, yeah, and throwing them all, all around. The tents were being, the pegs of the tents were losing, or being, or, or being uh, blown away loose and, and uh, the tents were falling you know, upon the the soldiers were inside, the things were getting ruined, uh, sand was covering people's uh, belongings and you know, people were pretty, pretty poor at the time, for you, if you had a sword or you had something that was valuable to you, it's understand, it's going to take you a long time to find, it's impossible, imagine looking in sand, snow is one thing, snow you wait for the snow to thaw, but what are you going to do with sand? There's nothing to do with sand, like it's very hard for you to find what you want to find. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it was simple, some wind, some doubt, some fear, some miscommunication, some betrayal, and we're done. Uh, I'll talk about how it ends in more detail, inshallah, as we go along. But the, the first ayah that talks about this story begins with the ending of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look, I ended it, it's done. You remember the, the blessing? Remember the blessing. I, yani, these soldiers came to you, and I sent some wind and some soldiers, and it was done. However, I was watching everything that you did. And the word basira is all seeing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regarding what you did, I was seeing it all. It's easy. Uh, they came, you were scared, and you thought it was a big deal, right? I sent them away with some wind and some soldiers. You didn't even see them. You didn't even know what I did. You have no idea. It wasn't malaika. It was something even simpler than that. Now, they're gone? Okay, let's talk about what you guys did during the time that they were here, which is way more important, which is the point of me sending them to begin with. We're focused on the results. He's focused on the behavior until that happens. Are you saying the difference? We're, as humans, we're focused on the result. When am I going to get this? When is that finally going to happen for me? When is my, yeah, when is my income going to change? When am I going to get this job? When am I going to have my first child? When am I going to be able to move out of this house? When am I going to be able to get married? You're always looking towards a result, and he is watching you. He's watching your behavior in the meantime. And when he gives you the results, he'll remind you. Remember when I gave you the results? 
Remember how it came to you? You got okay. Let's talk about before that. Let's go. This is what this surah does. Remember how they came and I and I sent them away? Yes. Let's talk about what happened and be, before that. I have to, I have to bring up with you, Subhanallah, Jalla Jalla He has to bring up with us, Subhanahu wa Taala, a number of things that went on that shouldn't have went on, and he'll commend a number of things that did go on that you know, were happy that they went on. That he was happy, Subhanahu wa Taala, and he is pleased by the fact that they that they went on, and the usage of the word bima ta'amaluna. Basira. If you remember, I've explained to you that the concept of knowledge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names, you have the name Alim that encompasses everything. He's the all-knowing of everything. And then there are other names that are a bit more specific. So the name Samia is usually focused on things that can be heard. The name Basir is usually focused on things that can be seen. The name Latif are usually focused on things that are undetected, meaning small acts that usually uh, are hard to, for us to detect whether they're inner or uh, internal or external. Khabir are things that happen in your heart. He, he knows about things that are happening inside. So he didn't use the word Khabir here. Because Khabir, you believe in him. You already said that when you, when you gave your pledge. Isn't that what the first ayah told us in, the, in today's study? You've already been taking the pledge and the covenant has been taken from you. You've already accepted that. Now he wants to see what you do. Your behaviors have to have to be a testimony of that, of that faith that you claim that you have. I have to testify for it. That's why you use the name Basir. And then I watch what you did. You can't say, no, Ya Rabbi, but inside I believe you. No, I don't want what's inside right now. Now things are really difficult. Show me action. Show me what you can do. Can you stand your ground? Can you stand your ground? Can you hold on to it? Will your behaviors prove it? It's very simple. Well, the examples I'm giving you should be, you know, just think about it in a, in a more, you know, day-to-day -day human context. You tell your wife you love her, you tell her you love her, and then in a very scary situation, you jump, you leave her behind. That, if, if something like that happens, I hope it never happens to any of you, inshallah, yeah, inshallah, this never happens to you. But if it does, you can never fix that with her, ever. Ever again. No matter what, how much you try to fix it, if, if not some Allah, yeah, and you're walking with your wife in some explosion, and you jump and take cover, and she's standing there, she will never forgive you, and that will never work again. Why? Because that's, yeah, you say it, but then when it came to actually proving it, you know, there was nothing there. Now, do you always have to prove it like that? No. Most, 99% mo yeah, of time in life, you don't have to. But t moments will come where you're required to prove it. Can you prove it? There are a number of moments in life where that, uh, and those who, in, in couples and, and, and groups of people, who go through, who go through moment, moments like that and stick together, have a bond like no other. Have a bond like no other. If you go through a moment of fear, of difficulty, and you have someone standing by, you stand with each other, and, and you strengthen each other, the bond there is unbreakable forever and ever. However, you have many uh, friends that you live a very easy life with, and you don't really know who they are until something difficult happens. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا And he was watching. Because now it was based on, uh, it was based on behavior. Yeah, you all said, La ilaha illallah. They've said it. Some of them have said it. What, what year was this? Is year number five? Or no? The end of four, beginning of five, we're not sure. This has been 18 years into his prophecy, sallallahu alayhi wa Some people amongst them had been Muslims for 18 years. Some of them for less. But you've already said, La ilaha illallah for 18 years. Proof. Let's see now. The proof was... Uh, <laughs> there, there, was a there was a variation, <laughs> to say the least. People varied in, in how they dealt... Um, with what happened. SubhanAllah is already nine. SubhanAllah. All right. I think I'll stop with, with that, inshallah. Um, ayah number 10 and 11 and 12. It starts to break down what went on. Now, I know uh, you've all heard Ghazwat Lahzab before, but mark my words, you haven't heard this full, the full version, the, the full Quranic version yet. I, I, I am sure. Like even when I tell the seerah stories, I can't bring this whole thing because usually, tell it, unfortunately, I usually tell the seerah to kids, so a lot of this stuff don't don't resonate with them very well. But I guarantee you that even if you've heard so, the, the story of the Battle of Ahzab, a lot and it's funny. A lot of what's in this surah is not discussed in these in these stories, which is which is very weird to me because when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala told us the story, this is what He chose to speak of. He told you immediately, it worked out. You guys were scared and it worked out. It was very fearful, it was very difficult, it all worked out. Now let's talk about what happened. A lot of things happened here that shouldn't have happened. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes through a number of incidents that happened during those days. And I, and I encourage you, like before, before we meet again inshallah on Sunday, to read them yourself. Just for your own benefit. And think about them yourself. Wallah, you'll find a lot of benefit. Yani, you will come up with a lot of answers even before I tell you things. And some ayat you'll be reading, you're like, I have, I have no idea what this ayat means. I've never, I've never understood this before. And you go look for it and you find, wow, that actually something like that happened on that day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke of it and left out other things. Like I told you the detail of who said the who came up with the idea of the trench, how, they, how long it was, how do you find any of these details in the Quran? Nothing. 
Nothing. <laughs> it's very, it's very interesting. I mean, where is the con where is the whole trench thing in the surah? <laughs> it's, not, it's not there. It's not important. That happened. That's not what I'm talking about. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala granted victory. He sent them away. Let's talk about you know how you. That's why you're going to find in these ayat the Subhanahu wa Taala will tell you follow Rasulullah Sallallahu in everything. This is where لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ because he is the ultimate example of someone who follows and obeys and submits to Allah's will Subhanahu wa Taala in all situations, easy and difficult. And he was the per he was the it was a perfect example for us. Many of the Muslims and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Meaning we're not here. We're going to read these ayat, and this is, what, this is why people don't talk about these ayat very often. If you want to know why, because you're like, well, why isn't this discussed more often? I'll tell you why. It's very simple. Because these ayat have criticism of Sahaba. That's why. Any ayat in the Quran that contains any criticism of the Sahaba, you find that scholars don't talk about, or not scholars. You know, it, do, it doesn't make its way to the common, yani, or, or or the media outlets of Islamic, uh, yani, narrative. Why? Because a lot of people don't know how to deal with it. They think that if you're criticizing a Sahabi, that means this person is no longer yani, good anymore. No, they're human beings like us. If they weren't human beings, then there would be no point of us telling this story to begin with. They had to be human beings with human emotions and human reactions and human mistakes in order for us to learn from them. They're still better than us. They always will be. Why? Because we cannot go back in time and live those moments. We can't stand by him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can't. So even if they made mistakes by th back then, they, they, still, they still outrank us. I'm going to end with this example so you understand what I'm talking about. And that's why this, these ayat aren't uh, you know, known uh, as famous as they should be. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, one of the Sahaba, he tells a story of the day of uh, Hazab. I'll tell it to you, inshallah, towards the end of the, of the ayat. But I, I, what I'm interested in is what happened when he finished telling the story. When he finished telling the story, a part of the story was that you know, people, the Prophet so said, at a certain point stood up and said, Who will do this and he'll go to Jannah? No one stood up. Who will do this and he'll be with me in Jannah? No one stood up. Who will do this and he'll be with me in Jannah and get this and this? And no one stood up. It was and then Hudayfa was chosen. And then so, so one of the tabi'een, one of the people who came after said, what, what is this? If we were there, we would have carried Rasulullah on our shoulders. That's what he said. If he said, who would do this? We would be the first people to put our hands up. We would be the first people to be out there. So Hudayfa looked at them and said, Be quiet, you weren't there. You weren't there, you don't know what it was like. You don't know. You don't know what it was like. You have no idea. You don't know what we, were, what we had been through. You don't know. You weren't there. You don't get to judge me. <laughs> Basically, they were, they were judging. Because Hudayfa is Aminu Sirri Rasulillah He was the person the Prophet وسلم, confined in, told him secrets that he told no one else. Not even Umar, Umar ibn Khattab, not even Abu Bakr. Only Hudayfa. And they're saying, what is this? You guys are acting your Sahaba and your Sahaba. And you guys are sitting there and he's telling you to go to Jannah. You're not going to get it. You don't know. You weren't there. And he's saying that, idea that don't judge the Sahaba, don't judge any of them. You don't know what it was like. You don't know. They're human. They made mistakes. Some of them didn't. Some of them did. Doesn't make, doesn't lessen their status at all. But if we're so scared from maybe someone understanding that, that we fail to even tell the story and benefit from it, I think we're killing. <laughs> yeah, we're we're losing a gem or many gems. So if we can just agree right now that when we talk about these ayat and we talk about certain sahaba uh, some of them are named some of them are not who made mistakes who said things they shouldn't have said that we're not talking about the status of the sahaba at all at all how dare we <laughs> speak of the people who stood by rasulullah but we have to learn from these incidents and we have to benefit from them these ayat are very very beautiful and very very deep and i and i yeah, i'm looking forward inshallah to talking about them we'll be we'll, we'll continue inshallah next week after salat al-isha jazakum allah khair subhanak allah wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in jazakum allah khair barakallahu feekum